Hello, everyone. Welcome to a very special interview. Today, I'm here with the writer and creator of The Karate Kid, Robert Mark Kamen. Um, how are you doing today, Robert? I'm doing good today. Great, great. Um, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to do this interview. I'm really excited, a uh, huge fan, and I can't wait to talk about the the new More Than Miyagi documentary and Karate Kid. It'll be a lot of okay. fun. Fire away. So um, when you first saw the whole documentary put together, you were involved in it in the interviews. When, but when you saw it put together, what were your initial thoughts? Uh, I was very moved. I, I, I was, uh, you know, I've been close to Pat for a long time, and I was responsible for Pat Morita becoming more than Arnold and becoming, you know, becoming the person, the coming Mr. Miyagi who made him an icon. Yeah. And so, so I always had a very special bond with Pat, you know, um, he took what I put on a page and made it amazing. He made it something that, you know, just, I don't know. Uh, how old are you? I am 18 years old. You're 18 years old. I wrote this 38 years ago. Wow. Yeah, so he took what I wrote and made it eternal. Yeah, and and so you know, Pat and I had that that thing, and I spent a lot of time with him on set. Um, I spent a lot of time with him offset when we were filming. So I spent a lot of time with Pat, and when I saw the documentary, it was kind of sad because it did um, show exactly what was going on with a guy who had a hard life and was quite tortured, but it also showed the opportunity he got um, because of the Miyagi character to really become an icon. So many people talk about Mr. Miyagi. I mean, you, you didn't because you didn't see the film until mm -hmm. after COVID guy, but you're probably wondering who's this Miyagi guy they're talking about. Who's this Miyagi guy they're talking about. Well, it, you know, he, he became very iconic for a lot of people, and he's an iconic character that people quote. And so Pat and I shared a big something. Yeah. For me, when I watched, because um, I watched Cobra Kai first, so I saw Daniel, Johnny, Kreese as the senseis. But then going back and watching Karate Kid and seeing Miyagi, I'm like, this guy is is way better of a sensei compared to all these guys he just really had that true like way of being a teacher and a father figure he had them yes he had the magic he yeah. had the magic uh, nobody else in the show has that magic because he was a unique character and um i've been studying okinawan goju karate for my whole life since i'm 16 uh 1964 16 yeah I've been studying it my whole life. I'm 73 years old. And so that philosophy, what made that character, all that was baked into me for a very long time. And Pat brought it to life. He became Mr. Miyagi. He became what I imagined Mr. Miyagi to be. He became, except more, you know. Yeah. And it was a great opportunity for him. And he rose to it and he rose above it. Yeah. Can you talk about that? The karate that you did when you were a kid, uh, was it like similar to Miyagi-Do karate? Is that where you got the inspiration? I was just talking to the guys who, uh, who do Cobra Kai about this. Um, in, it, it should be more than what it is, but, but they don't have, you know, if I was designing the, the karate and everything else, it would be more in keeping what Mr. Miyagi's philosophy was. And the karate would reflect that. Um, and it sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, it goes in and out. But you have to have somebody doing that stuff who knows that stuff to be able to affect it in the show. And after all, you know, you're doing a television show and, you know, it's not about goju karate. It's not about the deep philosophical underpinnings except mr miyagi's character if you watch the film 
everything he does is about the philosophy of what this system is and it's unique. So, um, you know, yeah. it is what it is. Yeah. The films definitely, what I really love about them is, uh, they don't like tell you everything. They imply things. So, uh, in Karate Kid 2, when, Miyagi tells Daniel the story about the first Miyagi. You hear these stories, but you don't see it. So it leaves like potential for this whole other world, like the with Mr. Miyagi in the future. Yes, it does, doesn't it? Yeah. Is is that something <laughs> you've thought of, like uh telling the stories of uh because I know in the documentary, and I found this really interesting, was you mentioned that instead of Karate Kid 3, you wanted to do a story on the first Miyagi, which was the story that Miyagi told Daniel and Karate Kid 2. Uh, can you talk about that? Stay tuned. Oh, wow. Okay. okay. Uh, you know, it's, listen, I'm, I'm still an active screenwriter. You know, I still get a lot of movies made and I'm still write, writing full time. And um, Mr. Miyagi lives in me. He's never left me ever so who knows that, that gets me very excited wow okay um was there a particular scene from the documentary that resonated with you the most when watching no not really it just um i just got really sad watching uh how hard pat's life was the the up and downs of it and because I had seen, I had kept in touch with him and I had seen him in his later years when he was in declining health, when the scene where he couldn't come out to the 30th anniversary of happy days because he was so drunk. And it just made me really sad because he had a really hard life. And what I never knew was that most of the time when he was up, uh, filming, he was, you know, under the influence of alcohol. Yeah, that, that was that was sad. What yeah. made me happy was that this guy who had a really hard life achieved something that very few people achieved. He was the first Asian American to be nominated for an Academy Award. Yeah, and uh, and that uh, that made me happy. Yeah, Pat Morita definitely. Uh, from watching the documentary, because I didn't know much. I didn't know too much about him. I all I saw was. Mr. Miyagi on screen and that's right. kind of what who you assume the the real actor is but there's a whole nother story can you talk about right. uh Pat Morita like breaking those barriers um like being an Asian actor you know like during those times where like the roles like you were getting getting like stereotyped into or typecast into roles can you talk about how he broke those barriers um well, one thing, one way he broke it is that he was a comedian. And what better way to get people to pay attention than to make them laugh? And nobody knew the depth he had beyond being a comedian. And so when he was offered a, I mean, Arnold was basically shtick, you know, he was doing comedy. But when he was offered a role like Miyagi, he could bring that inherent humor to a dramatic persona. And while he's teaching an important lesson, can make it funny. You yeah. know, I mean, that scene where he tells Daniel to, wa to wash the cars and he explains to him, karate is yes, karate is no. If you do karate, maybe you get squished like a grape. You understand? I think so. Good. And he puts a sponge in his hand. That's funny. Yeah. But 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 before it, he tells him, basically, if you're going to do something, you don't do it half-assed. You commit to it. Because if you don't commit to it, you're going to get squished like a grape. Nothing's going to happen. And, you know, if, if you say if you played it straight and just gave that lecture to some kid in a classroom... I'm falling asleep. I'm looking at my phone. I'm looking for popcorn. I'm, but if you do it the way he did it, and he says, look, you know what? You either commit to something or you don't commit to something. If you don't commit to it, what's the point of doing it? But Pat did it in a funny way. 
he brought the Pat Morita ness to it. And that was his gift. That was his gift to the whole Karate Kid. He had one dramatic scene in the whole movie, and that was the drunk scene. Every other scene, he brought that humor and that ability to make people listen to what he was saying through humor. Yeah. And obviously, Miyagi has a lot of lessons that he teaches Daniel that um, you can tell especially from Karate Kid 2 and 3, like as we learn more about Miyagi, that those lessons come from his own life experience. And considering you were the one who wrote those lines, uh, did you get like inspiration from those lessons, like such as like doing like full commitment things? Was that like something that you faced and that's why you wrote it? Um, I learned that lesson. I learned the, the first karate school I went to, you, you had better commit because if you didn't commit, you were going to get run over. I was a 16 year old kid and I walked into a karate dojo of grown men, you know, even not even grown men. Some of them were 21 and 22, but some of them were 28 and 30 and they were big guys. And I was not a big guy and I'm still not a big guy. And I learned that if you didn't pay attention, you were going to get hammered. And so I dedicated myself. I took a lot of beatings. It was a lot of training, but I dedicated myself to, to the art. And I learned that um, in high school and college, I ran track and I wasn't particularly gifted. I just trained really hard to, to be able to compete. And I learned that through, you know, through commitment and hard work, you can get somewhere. That's all. And, and, you know, I never thought of it that way. I just, I just said, Oh, I better, I better pay attention here. And that's what Mr. Miyagi teaches Daniel, but in a nice way, in a fun way. And then he teaches them. It's kind of a life lesson. Yeah. And it's very interesting because I, I feel like Kreese also taught his Cobra Kai is the same thing, but obviously in a different way. Um, can you talk about like where any of um, the Cobra Kai scenes, the strike first, strike hard, no mercy? Like, how did you come up with that aspect? Um, I, um, I walked into a karate school when I was looking for a karate school. I walked into one with a guy who was like, Chris, he was a scary, tough guy. And he only understood hitting people. And, um, uh, and that to me seemed like the wrong philosophy. You know, there's, uh, Mr. Miyagi says to Daniel, Daniel son, karate is for defense only. That's it. You know what? You don't hear that from, from a lot of karate schools. Um, karate in, in America has become a sport and in the sport it's offensive. You are looking to score a point. You are looking to hit your opponent, whatever it is, and it's offensive. The system I learned is you're never looking to hit anybody. Never. You're looking, if somebody hits you, you're looking to defend yourself. Now, you can defend yourself one of two ways. You can defend yourself very strong, or you can defend yourself by using somebody's strength against you. And all those blocks, all the wax on, wax off, and the blocking you know, paint the fence and that stuff. That's all using somebody's strength against them. So when somebody's punching you, instead of blocking them really hard, which is one system, and clashing arms, you wax, wax on, wax off, and you deflect it, and you take their energy, and you move it this way. And then when the energy's going that way, then you punch them in the face. <laughs> <laughs> how how did you come up with those things? Because that I think um, fans would say is like one of the most clever things of the movie. The chores becoming the karate. Yes, um, I'm in the make shit up business, dude. <laughs> I, I just took what I knew and I I thought of something imaginative that would pay off later on. Um, when you're when you work in the imagination factory, you're tool is your imagination. So I knew all the karate moves and I just applied, you know, imagination to them. 
what could I make the, how can I make this different? That's what I did. That's, That's how it worked. Yeah. Yeah. And what I find so fascinating, especially for me, um, about karate kid, um, growing up in like today's day, you know, like I grew up with technology and you have social media. So everyone has a cell phone. I feel like karate kid, um, is an escape, um, for someone like me, like, cause like sometimes I do, like, I look at that movie, I'm like, it would be pretty cool to ride your bike to school. And, you know, everyone's just hanging outside doing that. Um, can you talk about like that, like compare like that day and age to like that? What if like that story took place today, how different it would be? First of all, everybody would have their face to their device. <laughs> you guys live on your devices. <laughs> You know, um, social media, all of this stuff. In 1984, there take take away take your phone away, take your device away. You'd be lost. You'd have to find something to fill up that time. How many hours a day do you spend on social media? Uh, I've been trying not to. I try to. Yeah, how's that working out for you, bud? <laughs> well, I mean, doing this YouTube, it kind of sometimes forces me to be on it, but I try my best to. Avoid it. As much yeah. As I can. Imagine if you took all that time and energy and effort and put it into studying Okinawa and Goju Karate. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, when I first started training, I did four hours a day, four hours a night, seven to 11 every night. So imagine if you had four hours that you spent on your device every day and, you know, social meeting and texting and TikToking and everything else. And you went to the dojo and you took those four hours and you learned how to do Okinawan Goju Karate. Be a different thing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Would. Yeah. Then you could be a real karate nerd instead of a fake one. <laughs> uh, so can you talk about, um, I know you talked about how close you were with Pat Morita. Um, can you talk about like your relationship on and off set? Well, on set, he was working and we would just sit around. Off set, we'd go bar hopping. <laughs> <laughs> when we were in Hawaii, it was me and him and Danny, um, the guy who played Sato. And, the, and the, those guys were very well known in Hawaii. Pat was like a god over there. They loved him after the first movie. And uh, we'd, go, we'd go out drinking. and. I'm not a heavy drinker and those guys could just put it away. And so, you know, as the evening wore on first, it was funny. And then it got a little grim and it wasn't so much fun, less fun. Yeah. Um, he was, uh, I really liked Pat, but Pat had, you know, he just had these demons. He and he, 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 on the, on one side, a lot of comedians are that way. They have a very dark side. And this other side is that he had this hot dark side that he hid with humor. Yeah. Did he ever uh, talk to you about any of this or did he like kind of keep things to himself? Mostly kept things to himself. And except when he got drunk and then he would, he would talk, it would come out, but not in bursts. It would come out in a sentence here, a sentence there. And then he would revert to being happy. Um, but he had it, – it was complicated for him. He had a complicated relationship with his daughters who are not in the documentary. They refused to participate. Um, you know, and he, had, uh, he had his childhood, which was tough for him, and not becoming what every Asian parent wants their child to be, which is – you know, a successful doctor, lawyer, businessman, something, he chose a harder path and it was not easy for him. Yeah. And what's remarkable is through his performance, uh, you can't even tell that he was facing any of these things was no. Yeah. W was all, was he really able to hide it? Like when he was filming? Yeah. Look at, look at his performance. Look how beautiful. And then yeah. when you get this scene when he's drunk and talking about his life, the pain comes out and, and yes, he's acting, but he's chat, he's tapping into the pain he had. Yeah. 
And what impressed you the most about his performance in the Karate Kid movies, would you say? How he was the embodiment of Mr. Miyagi. I mean, I, I, I was like, I would used to watch it and I'd sit there with John Amelson and we just kind of say, oh my God, John, I mean, how lucky are we to have found this guy? He's the actual embodiment of what's on this page. He makes it real. You know, otherwise it's just, you're reading it. You're just reading those lines, but this guy breathed life into it. And, and, and now that you've seen the film, imagine people who saw the film first years ago before the brilliance of Cobra Kai and, and Mr. Miyagi has become an icon. Everybody talks about Mr. Miyagi and people quote Mr. Miyagi and, you know, they're really quoting me, but they're mm. quoting Mr. Miyagi and, and they talk about it because they saw Pat Morita deliver those lines. And to them, it's, it's this wise old man, this funny, wise old man who says things funny, but they're very profound. And so people relate to that. Everybody wants that in their life. Don't you want that in your life? Somebody who is funny and generous and kind and compassionate and understanding. And then if you need it, they can beat the shit out of the people who are bullying you. Oh, that's the perfect person to have in your life. For sure. Perfect. And they never, never lay any guilt on you. Imagine. <laughs> yeah. And what, what, uh, I think karate kid two did so great was even though he was this perfect guy, um, you know, with everything he was dealing with back home with his father dying and with Sato, it really brought the human out of him and especially the drunk scene. I thought that was great. So, yeah. Um, can you, so, with this YouTube channel and um, what, what I like to do is I like to make movies, videos, and I hope to do like filmmaking and uh, writing as a career as I um, go down the line, study in college and all that. So um, I'm curious to talk to you about that. Um, when did you first start uh, writing screenplays and how did you, um, what made you want to pursue it as a career? What, may, what what made me want to pursue it as a career is that I got positive reinforcement and it paid me a bunch of dough. <laughs> I was I was on an academic track. I I had gotten a PhD. I was supposed to teach at a university. But uh, somebody bought a screenplay I wrote and I saw, saw the check and I couldn't make that as an academic in forever. So I said, oh, well, I'll do this. And then I found that I was good at it and they kept paying me. And I kept doing it and they kept making the movies and I kept doing it and they kept paying me. And the next thing, you know, here I am 40 years later. Wow. So, so you didn't even go to film school. No, no, no. I got a PhD in American studies from the university of Pennsylvania. I didn't go to film school. I didn't know from film. And I still, I, I never wanted to be a director or producer. I just wanted to write. I like writing. And what was that film that you wrote? It was called Crossings, and it was never made. What was it about? It was about three kids who, uh, um, from university, lie to their parents what they're going to do for their Christmas vacation, and they go to Afghanistan to smuggle hash. <laughs> and, and they learn life lessons, and it becomes a whole different thing. And that's what it was about. And Warner Brothers bought it, and I was off to the races. And then I did a movie called Taps, which you should watch if you haven't watched it, with Timmy Hutton and Sean Penn and Tom Cruise. And then I did another movie called um, Split Image. And then I did The Karate Kid. Yeah. And it's seen, it sounds easy, um, but I caught all the right breaks. Yeah. So... So you wanted to study, you wanted to become a teacher, but was writing just one of those passions from when you were a kid that was like Yeah, I liked writing. I liked writing when I was a kid. I didn't want to become a a, a professor. I didn't want to do that. I, it's what I was doing. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but that seemed to be the thing I was doing. And until I could find the thing that I was doing. And I found something that I was passionate about and and that paid great. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, so with the karate kid, how did you originally conceive the idea? And, uh, I know you took karate. Um, how much of that was inspiration for the film? 
Oh, a lot. I mean, um, Frank Price, who was my mentor, was chairman of Columbia Pictures. And he called me up and said he had just optioned an article about a nine-year-old kid who got a black belt. He knew I knew. He said, do you know stuff, something about this? I said, yeah, I know nine-year-old kids shouldn't have black belts. Um, he said, well, you know, we were thinking of making a movie out of it. And I said, well, okay, I have a movie. And I told him my story about Mr. Miyagi and about Daniel and about all this stuff. And he bought it. And I wrote it. And he made it. And life changed for all of us. Yes, definitely. So for when all you're, of us. Yeah. Even for people now like me who haven't watched it when it came out. It's great. Yeah. Yeah, no, no. Life changed for everybody. And you can imagine that all these years later now, Billy and and Dan, uh, I was going to call him Danny, and Ralph, and Billy and Ralph and uh, Marty Cove. Uh, well, Marty Cove has had kind of a, he's had kind of a good career. But all these guys, you know, what was Ralph doing? What was Billy doing? They, you know, and now they're big TV stars. I don't know if it'll lead to anything else for them, but you know, they can do this for a while. Yeah. I, I think, I think it's definitely what's so great about the show is um, just the, just like the karate kid, the karate kid had such a wide age range uh, that like of people who liked it, people um, older could relate to Miyagi people younger related to Daniel. That's what Cobra Kai is doing too. Yeah, I think Cobra Kai is, I think what these, the three guys have done uh, is just brilliant. And they're Karate Kid nerds. I mean, they know more about these films than I do. <laughs> Did you um, meet with them before they, yeah. before they wrote the idea? Yeah, they had the idea. They signed up uh, Billy and Ralph. Um, and, um, then they told me, I don't remember how that came about, but I think they called me up and told me about it and they came and visited me up here in, no, I, no, I met them in LA first and we had a great dinner and then they came up and visited me where I live. I live, I own a, a vineyard. I live on a vineyard and uh, up in Sonoma and they came and visited and spent a weekend with their wives and, and we had just the best time and we talked and. And I told them stuff. And the next thing I know, the stuff I told them was ending up in Cobra Kai. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. They were amazing. Um, you know that scene where you meet Tori, the bad girl? Yeah. And she's, what's your name, Tori with a Y? Well, that's like Allie with an I in The Karate Kid, right? Um, my oldest daughter is Allie with an I. I started writing The Karate Kid the day she was born. My youngest daughter is Tori with a Y. And um, and she is a little Allie is very proud of of everything. Tori, who is also a screenwriter, is, you know, she's much more low key and doesn't. My high profile is not for her. And I just thought it would be funny if I put that in and I got them to put it in, name the character Tori with a Y. And she doesn't watch Cobra Kai because she's sick of the Karate Kid. And um, her friends do. And they called her up and said, Tori. You're not going to believe what your father did. <laughs> and, it, and it, you know, I get this phone call. What is wrong with you? What is wrong with you? I thought I thought it was funny. It's not funny. I don't think it's funny. <laughs> oh my god! It's, so she wasn't thrilled by it. No, and but and the guys were great. I said, "Can you do this?" She said, "Sure, we can do that. That'd be great." <laughs> oh wow, that's that's funny. You would think she would be like the happiest person that her name she is. She grew up with it. You know, she doesn't want to hear it. She's very low key and, and she doesn't, she don't want to hear about it. She grew up, you know, with, it, with the movie business and to her, it's a whole different thing. She takes a lot of stuff much more seriously than I do. She's much more, and she went to graduate school for screenwriting. She went to USC and she's very good. Um, but, you know, for me to do things like that, that's not, you know, she thinks, oh, why do you do things like that? What's wrong with you? Why don't you, you know, what's wrong with you? I said, well, I did it to get a reaction from you. Well, you got a reaction from me, okay? Don't do it again. <laughs> well, now, her, now t we have Tori for the rest of the show. So For the rest of the show. <laughs> uh, um, and she's great. She's a great character. 
she is yeah yeah um did um do your daughters in real life did they like say oh i know Allie. um you said Allie was born the day you started writing but in real life do they when they people ask them what their name is do they say Allie with an i or she used to she she never told people what i did she was very my oldest daughter was very shy as a kid but recently she said she was in a, a bar or a restaurant. She was in a restaurant and somebody said, hey, that girl behind the bar, she's Allie with an eye from the Karate Kid. And Allie said, bullshit. No, she's not. <laughs> she went over to her and said, hey, listen, you know, I, my name's Allie. You know, my father wrote the Karate Kid. I'm Allie with an eye. And, and you know, she's a 35-year-old woman doing this. <laughs> and my oh. middle daughter loves that I named the 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 – the character, the female character in the third one, Jessica, she loves that, you know. Oh, it's your name? She Jessica? loves, yeah, her name's Jessica. Right. I throw their names into all the, uh, the girl in Walk in the Clouds is named Victoria. Uh, I throw their names wherever I can. I throw their names in. Two of them like it. One of them wishes I would just stop doing it. Yeah. Are any of the other characters, like the main characters, Daniel, Johnny, Crease, were they my, inspired? My nephews, not Crease, but uh, John, John Lawrence, and Daniel are were my nephews. Lucille was their mother. Um, who else is there? And there's Allie. There's no, they. That's Freddy? it. They were they were just family members. They were kids. Now they're grown up. They're 40, 42 years old, but, but they were kids. And uh, Lucille was their mother. Her maiden name was Lorenzo and I changed it to LaRusso and there you have it. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. Uh, so um, regarding um, working with John Avelson and Jerry Weintraub, um, I'm very curious on this as like someone who wants to like write myself. Um, What's the collabor collaboration process like after you write the script and then um, you have Avelson who's doing the directing? How do you collaborate after the script is written? Um, with John, we work together all the time. We would go over the scenes. He would make suggestions. I do rewriting. Uh, it, it varies from movie to movie, how closely you work with the director uh, or the producer. It varies. Uh, I like it best when I'm working directly with the director, with the filmmaker. Um, and he says, this is what I need. This is what I feel. Take a look at it this way. And you, you do rewriting. All writing is rewriting, all of it. So you just keep rewriting. I'm rewriting a script now for Idris Elba to write, star in and direct. And he gave me five pages of notes. So I'm doing the notes. Yeah. So I should be doing that instead of talking to you. <laughs> So during the filming, when you're on set and he's directing, do you, if something's not um, coming to the vision of how you write it, do you say something or it, does he like pretty much adhere to the vision? It depends. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm yawning. Um, it's, it's, not okay. that you're boring. it's not that you're boring. Um, well, a little bit. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but um, no, sometimes the director doesn't want you on set. And sometimes he always wants you on set. I would prefer not to be on set because it's boring for me. I sit there, I'm doing nothing. The director's directing, the cameraman is cameramanning, the sound guy is sounding, and I'm sitting eating donuts. <laughs> um, and and, and uh, sometimes I can give my opinion, but really the director is making the film, you know. And, and if he needs something and something's not working for him and he turns to me and says, look, this isn't working for me. Can we do it a different way? I try to do it a different way. But I try to stay off set as much as possible. Yeah. So w the the final film did um, with Avelson directing, did it like, it, did everything you wrote, did it come to life or were there any things where you wrote it and it didn't really come out how you wrote it? Um. You mean the Karate Kid three? Um, any of the Karate Kid movies? No, no. It all it all played just like John and I would talk about every scene. We talked about everything, and it all played exactly like it was written, exactly like we had talked about. It was great. It was a great working experience. I love John. Yeah. 
And um, a bit of a random question here. J uh, Johnny Lawrence and John Kreese both shared the same first name. Is there a particular reason for that? I'm lazy. <laughs> I had to give Kreese. I had to give Kreese a name, so I gave him a name. I should have given him a different name. Yeah, but I was I was lazy. I was just lazy. I think it's kind of uh, realistic in a way because a, a lot of movies don't have two characters with the same name. So maybe it, I, even though it was a little like, I, it was, could be a I was lazy. I should have thought of a different name and I, I just didn't. I should have called him Steve or something, <laughs> you know, or Carl. Carl Kreese would have been good. Bart Kreese would have been good. <laughs> yeah. Well, Kreese is oh everyone pretty much refers to him as crease so it yeah it everybody, nobody calls him anything but crease so it's yeah. okay but in cobra kai in season three some people call him john yeah back in the flashbacks yeah and yeah and i think um um in karate kid three i think terry calls him john or johnny boy or something i think he does i but i don't remember yeah what did you uh think of those uh, crease flashbacks exploring um, the story that you set up with the military background. I think it was interesting. I think it was, I think the snake pit was interesting. I love, I'm sorry. I love the way they tie stuff in, like the cobras in the snake pit. All of a sudden, his karate becomes Cobra Kai, or um, the guy he saves, um, or, you know, I just thought it was interesting. I, I thought it was interesting. So I would have some of the choices I would have made, some of the choices I wouldn't. But these guys, you know, I thought it was super interesting the way they were building character. Did you have a background uh, for Crease like that? No, no. They they have now given him a life, and um, and and he's going to have to live with that life for the rest of his life, for however long that is. You know, he's now. He's now John Kreese, who was at the snake pit. John Kreese, who was in the military with a, um, a sadistic commander. You know, that kind of thing. So who knows? Yeah. I just thought it was very smart the way they did it. Yeah, I, I love those scenes. It, it was great. And it makes you sympathize with him a little bit. Not too much, but. No, not, too, not enough. Yeah. Not enough. He's... Is there anything else? Because I got to go. I got to go to work. Oh, okay. Some um, of us work for a living, you know. <laughs> Are you in yeah. college yet? Um, I am in my last year of high school, so I'm about to go to college. This is amazing. You're doing this. This is absolutely amazing. Where are you going to go to college? Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure yet. Still deciding. Where are you, where are you applying? Um, I'm from Jersey, so some schools in Jersey. Right. You'll be in it's Rutgers before you know it. <laughs> well, Princeton. You can go to Princeton. Maybe, maybe. I'm not sure. Um, do you mind if I ask you uh, one more question sure. before you go? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to find a good one. Um, you have a million questions there? I do have a million questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me see. Well, well here's one that um, I would like to know for me personally and for any um, – young filmmakers out there, people who are interested in doing what you do. Uh, can you, do you have any tips or advice for people who want to get into the industry? Um, it's a very tough industry. If I thought find the best way to get into it is to write, write something, then you have something to sell. Um, I would say go to film school because this way you really get to learn the technical parts of this. That's what I would do. Um, if I had my druthers, um, and then you better be passionate about it because there are a lot of people trying to get in. It's a, there's a door and, uh, that door is guarded very, very assiduously. And, and you've got to find a way to get in that door. And then you got to find a way once you're in the room, not to get kicked out of the room. So, you know, as a writer, I say, just use your imagination and write stuff. Just keep writing stuff. Um, if you want to be a filmmaker, the best way in is to write something and then sooner or later, somebody will let you direct it. 
Yeah. It's, that, well, I mean, Karate Kid has, I've definitely looked up to Karate Kid for like making my projects and stuff. I've looked um, at the writing. So that's definitely inspired what I do and Good. Will, in the future. So um, I just want to thank you so much for your time. Sorry, um, I'm yawning so much. <laughs> no worries. I know. I know you had a bunch of interviews before this, so um, I did. I did. I'm really. I'm so over it. You were. You were fun though. Thank you. I, I didn't expect I, an 18 year old. <laughs> I I appreciate that. Um. So thank you so much. Uh. Everyone, remember to watch more than Miyagi out now on iTunes, Apple TV, Amazon, Vudu, Google Play, and um. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time, Mister Kamen. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Of course. Okay. Have, a, Bye. have a good day. Bye. Bye.